Hi, um, I have a few problems with my slides because I'm the only one that I uh, four by three, so they're a bit stretched. I'm sorry for that. Um, yeah, as Remy said, I'm Paul. Uh, I work at Netflix, an internet agency in the Netherlands. Uh, at Netflix, I'm a JavaScript developer. Um, but for the people who were there yesterday, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be giving a presentation about creating your own developers in JavaScript. <laughs> or teaching rabbits how to code in using Node.js. No, um, my presentation is going to be about apprenticeships and how you can be a good mentor. <coughs> oh, so, uh, show me hands. Uh, who of you are trying to hire developers right now? That's pretty much. And who of, how many of you are finding it really easy to find them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's because most of us are probably looking for experts. The developers who have a few years of experience, uh, failed GitHub account, and maybe a relevant university degree. It should be someone who can handle all your projects right from the start. Um, sorry. But there are just uh, a few of them, and they're all settled in the right job already. So unless you have an amazing proposition for them uh, and contact them yourself, they're not going to work for you. But if you find one who is keen on working for you, then chances are that he's probably not the one who you thought he would be. So I'm saying we should stop looking for experts and start looking for uh, ambitious, passionate beginners who, and grow them right within your own organization. You should, you should find your own beginners, your own future developers. <coughs> and there are a lot of future developers out there, but they don't know the first thing about developing yet. Now maybe they know the basics or maybe even more. Uh, but there's one thing those future developing heroes have in common is that they have a passion for it. Uh, web developing is something they really want to do, but they don't know how or where to start. Um, most of this, the times, those uh, developers are not self-educated. Why not? There's a, a, enough information to learn web development without a master. I think 80% of the people in this room are self-educated. So show me hands again. Who considers himself an autodidact? Yeah, that's about 80%. <laughs> Self-educated. <laughs> um, well, then for you, it's probably harder to understand why an apprenticeship is important. Um, if you're a developer for more than three years, then you've been there when an HTML5 went to the, into less call. And it was a lot easier for, to learn front-end development back then. Uh, the web has changed a lot since then. We now have more semantic elements, uh, the canvas elements, and SVG is getting more ground, custom web fonts, the list goes on for quite a while. And it's not all in the last three years, but uh, it's, get, it's getting more important those years. And it's way more information to learn uh, by yourself if you're trying to get into front-end development right now. So that's just like Wesley said earlier, it's even hard to keep up ourselves. And, but there are good resources, but I'll get into that a bit later. So who's the ideal apprentice? Uh, I don't really think that there are uh, rules for the ideal apprentice, but what I'm usually looking for is someone who's preferably not a, not a developer. I really want someone who's trying to make a career change or is unemployed. Someone who already is a developer probably knows too much to really benefit from an apprenticeship, and he's not as eager to learn. Also, um, someone without an education, at least not a relevant one. Uh, for someone with an education, it's much easier for them to find a job in web development. It also knows a thing or two already, so it's kind of the same problem as we have with a developer. Um, also very important, someone who's very ambitious. He really wants to learn and knows that he wants to be a developer. He's going to get a few very hard months of learning and practicing, and he should really want that. And he should know that it's not an internship. So what's the difference between an intern and an apprentice? Let's assume that this is our future developer. He has no relevant education. He's currently not working in the same field. He knows what he wants, and he doesn't give up. Or well, if this is our, our apprentice, then this is our intern. He is not a future developer. He's a future something. Um, he could become a designer, or maybe something completely different. Also, he's not likely to be working for your company when his internship is over. Not likely as an apprentice, anyway. Uh, that's because he's still exploring the right path for him. 
Um, and some interns are wisecracks who doesn't seem to listen to the word you say, but they are there to learn, but seem to think they know better that, uh, than, a lot of, than you a lot of times. So stay away from the intern and invest in the apprentice. But why invest in it? Why is an uh, apprentice important for you? Well, first of all, you're going to be learning a lot yourself. And that's something we all want here, because otherwise we wouldn't be sitting in this room. Um, when, you're, uh, when you're teaching, you have to think about uh, the problems in a different way than you, you are used to. You start questioning your own working methods. Uh, why am I beginning the project the way I am? Do I really need to do all those files when I start a project? And why do I begin with jQuery right from the start? And is the way I write CSS really how I should teach it to someone else? And if not, why have I been teaching, uh, we're doing it like that all the time? Well, you can't really prepare yourself for all those questions, so don't be afraid to look up the right way to do things while your student is sitting beside you. He can learn from, he can learn from you how you teach yourself. And uh, secondly, apprentices are moldable. You can teach them the things that you think are important. Do you think it's the right way to, uh, to uh, write JavaScript without any libraries at all? Then you can teach him that. Or maybe you think accessibility is something that had to be taught at an expert level. Then nobody's going to stop you from handling the Y area specifications. Just remember that he's there for a reason as well. And make sure you also give him what he wants. Um, apprentices are cheap. cheap. Some companies don't pay them at all, and I don't think that's fair, but uh, minimum wage is still pretty cheap. <laughs> the apprenticeship should only take a couple of months, and if he decides to stay after that, and you want him after, your, after the apprenticeship, then you can talk about the normal wage. And you shouldn't forget that these are developers of the future. They are going to create websites and apps that you are going to work with later on. So you better make sure that they know how, uh, how it's built the right way at least. So, and finally, if all goes well and he decides to stay at your company, you've gained um, great assets who's going to be an expert in a very, uh, very short time. But before you are trying to find the apprentice you want, make sure that you're going to be a good coach. Is coaching really something you want to do? Uh, it takes a lot of time and patience to teach someone and you have to prepare for that. But what makes a good coach? Uh, I was looking for tips how to become a better coach, coach, and I came across a lot of books and articles for coaching and business. But actually, the best tips came from sports coaching articles. Uh, this article by Elizabeth Quinn, who is an exercise physiologist and fitness consultant, actually sums up what you need the most to be a good coach, not only in sports, but also as a developer. So, a good coach knows the sport. To be able to teach, you must have good understanding of what you are going to teach. You should have enough experience and not just read a few books. Also, you should be someone who seeks out information. Uh, it's crucial in our line of work to stay up to date, especially and especially for mentors. Uh, you have to make sure that you are not teaching old tricks. And you should al always stay positive, be a motivator. If you're enthusiastic in a job, it is something that your apprentice will catch on. This also goes for being negative all the time. Um, it's even important to make sure that your co-works are positive, at least around him, and keep the apprenticeship fun and challenging, because that's the only way to motivate. A good coach also knows the athlete. Uh, you should be aware what the best way for your apprentice to learn is, because everybody is different. For some people, it works when you say that they suck, while others will crumble and never write another piece of code again. So pay, pay a good attention to his emotions, his strengths, and his weaknesses. You should also be a good communicator. You should be able to explain everything very clearly. This is very important in the first part of the apprenticeship. I'll get back to that a little bit, a bit later on as well. Um, but you also should be a good listener. You should welcome comments, questions, and input, and change your tra uh, training plan accordingly. Be disciplined. Uh, it's not that you have to make him run laps uh, if he doesn't code the way you want, but if he's late more than once, make sure that there are consequences. A good coach leads by example. If you set rules, make sure you also adhere to it. If you want respect, you must show respect. 
And finally, the display commitment. Show that you are looking for the best interests on your apprentice. And these are the tips Elizabeth Quinn gave. And I want to add one more. A good coach should also be a good student. Never forget that you are still learning and you always will be. To quote from this brilliant science fiction novel, Stand on Zanzibar, you don't have to know everything. You simply need to know where to find it when necessary. So showing how you learn to your apprentice will teach him how he can do that himself. Also showing that you are not all-knowing could give him more confidence. So when you have decided that you really want an, an apprentice and you want to be a coach, then it's time to find your apprentice. You should not use recruiters or other companies to get your apprentices. apprentices. If you keep an open spot and communicate that on your company's website or uh, on social media, the most eager apprentices are going to find you anyway. And, and if you're getting a few uh, apprentices for job interviews, make sure that you know who you're looking for. I've just given you a few handlebars, but try to think of your own ideal apprentice. And the most important thing is that you, as their possible mentor, has a good, have a good connection with him. Uh, it should really click, because you are going to be working intensely for a couple of months. And make sure that he knows what he's getting himself into, because every apprenticeship is different. The apprenticeship in my company, um, it's about three months, sometimes even six, but most of them are three months, where he or she will be working on real projects alongside the other developers and the mentor. During the apprenticeship, they could get extra training in parts where more attention is needed. Uh, this can be done through the company or through books or videos. And the apprenticeship is always 40 hours per week. Now, that is something most of them find really hard because it doesn't really pay much, so they want to work besides the apprenticeship. But to learn fast, at least 40 hours per week is really necessary. And during your apprenticeship, they will learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and everything else that is important as for a front-end developer at our company. But after telling what you're offering, you must also, also know what he's offering. What does he want to learn? What is, are his ambitions? Does he really want to be a front-end developer, uh, learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and everything in between? Because maybe he wants to be a full-stack developer, learning Ruby and PHP, besides the front-end part. Is that something your, uh, your company can offer? And perhaps he wants to be a desi uh, designer and a developer, uh, de designing in the browser. Obviously, it's important to know this be before you're taking someone under your wings. Um, it could be that you cannot offer it, at least not on your own. Uh, if you have other types of experts at your company, people are willing to be a coach as well, and you can train someone together. And if you know what he wants to learn, find out what he knows already. This is not very important in the selection process because knowledge is not something we're looking for, but passion. Um, but once you've chosen someone, it's the first thing you should find out. You can start with giving some easy questions. So think of a very easy question, something that you think he should know, then make it a bit easier and start with that simple stuff that your mother should know and work your way from, from there. Um, like, now, who's Tim Berners-Lee? That's uh, not very important in the job, but it gives that he knows a bit about the history of the web. And you know if he done some research before applying for an apprenticeship. And another good question is, if, do you know what HTML5 is? Of course, you should first find out what, if he knows what HTML is. But if he knows what HTML5 is, if he can explain it in his own way, that's very good. Because I think none of the people here will give the same answer if you ask them what HTML5 is. So it's good to find out what he knows about it. What is the, the most important thing is to find out what he knows, after, because after that you can give him an example assignment. With such an ex assignment, you can really see how far his knowledge is, how he solves problems, and how determined he is to do it right. You could give him an old part of a project or a custom assignment, and uh, make sure you set a deadline for a day or something, depending on the exercise. I normally use this one. It was a contest in 2011 called CSS Off. 
and it tests skills in HTML, CSS, and a bit about JavaScript. And there are a lot of things in it, custom fonts, duplicate images, different sections, a sticky header, this checkered pattern over there. It's a, sh for, uh, it's a short, uh, good way to teach someone, uh, to test someone else's skill. But a good thing is if you have your own assignment for him, something that tests the skills you want him to know. So now you know what he wants to know uh, and how much he knows already. You must figure out how you're going to teach him. It is easy to think about how you've learned yourself, but obviously that's not the way you should teach. You don't want him to start with tables or frame sets before struggling with CSS flows. You should think about what you wished you knew, what you know now. Be the mentor you wished you had. Uh, one good method that you're probably going to be doing in the first month is pair programming. Traditionally, it's with pair, pro pair programming, you sit uh, with two developers behind one desk working on the same project. One developer is coding while the other one reviews the code while it's being written. And these roles switch frequently to use both programmers' best qualities. In our case, the mentor, that's you, is the one doing coding. But the apprentice is not reviewing the code, he's learning from you. So explain everything you do in detail. The first week, this is going to cost a lot of time. You'll probably be able to do much in a week that you can normally do in a day. So make sure you know, uh, you know that beforehand. But as he's understanding the basics, you don't need to explain every little detail. At this point, you can ask him what he would do and in, in some cases. And well, you can ask him what kind of element he would use, what's how he would style a particular widget. And a fresh view on these things might surprise you. Uh, ask him a lot of questions, but also make sure that he asks you questions. Be open for everything and show him how he could find answers to his questions. But the most important thing is, uh, about teaching is being patient. Things that seem the easiest thing for you to understand might be extremely difficult to comprehend for a beginner. Even things like variables could be uh, hard to get for some people. Um, but most important thing about teaching is being patient. Things that, oh, sorry, I just said it. <laughs> um, well, if, uh, Sorry, um, I kind of lost it a bit. Uh, well, the first week is going to be the hardest, especially for you. You will know some things about his knowledge, but it's still pretty vague. Let's get back, let's get back to Apprentice and assume that he wants to be a front-end developer, um, but no, knows close to nothing about it. He knows what he wants, and it's something he really wants to do. And probably one of the first things he's going to ask you is, why are you using a text editor? because there must be an easier way to do it. 10 years ago, he was probably uh, using front page. Even that was better than writing everything by hand. So be prepared for these kind of questions. You don't want to attack him on the first day. Uh, if it's possible, try to match his first day with the first day of a new project. When, this way he can learn how you set up a new project and you can explain step by step how something like that is done. But if that's not possible, just make sure you do something that isn't too hard to understand. If you start writing your own WebGL animations, he's obviously not going to follow a word you're saying. So besides setting up a project, what would be a part of the basics of a front-end developer? One of the things is helping him understand the structure of an HTML document. Not through specifications, but print out a design and give him a marker and Ask us if he can uh, draw the different parts of, the, of a web page and then let him name them. Seeing how a website is built up is something that we see instantly, but that's because we've done it countless of times. To work like this, visualize it before even talking about HTML is really helpful. You don't need any coding skills to see that a menu is a menu. So now it's time to start coding. Uh, ignore everything above the body element, uh, for now at least, uh, because explaining meta elements and duct type is something for the future. Try to create HTML together based on the elements he just drew on the paper. Start by using HTML5 structure elements, because there's no need to know how you used to do it with tables or divs only. It will just be confusing. 
when you have the basic structure of the HTML page, you can start by explaining a bit about CSS. Just make sure you take everything in very easy and small steps. This is why the first week is going to be the hardest for the both of you. Make sure you've got enough time for him. In the first month, self-study is also very important. I mentioned it a couple of times, but learning where to find the right information is probably the most important thing at our job. If you just let him find information by himself, who knows what kind of websites he will come up. <laughs> yeah, W3 Schools has been the laughing stock of front-end development for quite a while now. Uh, last week I took a look at W3 Schools to see if it was still that bad. And I was surprised that they are doing a lot better. It took me an entire four pages to find a bad practice. And, well, to be fair, it was also the second one with code in it. Uh, one page later, I found the first misinformation. But um, anyway, even though W3 Schools is now widely considered not to be the best website to be learning HTML from, I think it's the one where a lot of us got started. Um, I know that I did. At first, we learned from it. And after a while, we, we, we knew what was wrong about it. So I'm not saying that you should send your apprentice to this website, but we should all not be so hard on W3 schools. But luckily, we now have websites with more correct information. Uh, Mozilla Developer Network is one of those websites, uh, just like webplatform.org. They are both generated and maintained by the community. That means if you see something wrong, you fix it yourself. Uh, the web platform docs also offer beginner's guides. Uh, which is great for your apprentice to, re uh, re to read through at times you'd have less time to work with him. It explains a bit about the history of the web, but also HTML, CSS, and JavaScript basics. Another good side is Stack Overflow. Um, I think m probably everybody knows about Stack Overflow. Who here doesn't know about Stack Overflow? Okay, well, that's good. So if you, if you ask you a question, maybe point him to Stack Overflow to find related questions, even if you know the answer yourself. And if the, his question isn't on it, that's good, because he can, you can then break the barrier of asking questions on the internet. So you, you should try to make him ask a question on Stack Overflow at least once. But not everything comes from online media. Books are a great way to learn as well. You can give, him, you can give it to him to read as homework, uh, there are a couple of great books for understanding modern web technologies. Introducing HTML5 is one of them. <laughs> it's written by Bruce Lawson and Remy. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Introducing HTML5 is a book that explains most of the new HTML5 elements and attributes in a way that is understandable for most readers. It's not just for beginners. It was made when HTML5 became more popular. Um, so it's also good for people who want to know more about HTML5. But it's a very good book to give to your apprentice. Uh, a much smaller book is HTML5 for Web Designers by Jeremy Keith. And don't be fooled by the title. That's not only for designers. It's also a great way to learn from. Um, another way to learn through the community uh, another way to learn is through the community. Uh, Stack Overflow is part of that, but also conferences like this one. And it's not only to learn. For me, my, my first front-end uh, conference was when I decided I really wanted to be a front-end developer. So conferences and local meetups are a great place to get inspired and also to meet new people. Um, the community is also on Twitter. So if you use Twitter, show them how you use it and how you get new information and who to follow. And finally, GitHub. Uh, our community thrives on open source, and GitHub is a great place to share your code and view others. The learning curve to use Git and other version control software is pretty steep, but it's worth to know how to do it and what it's for. And there are a lot of more places to get your information, so a lot of choices to make. I had a few slides about that, but Wesley already talked about that, so I'll just skip that part of, part of my presentation. <laughs> But we can't only learn from other front-end developers. Uh, a website is not pure front-end. We work with people from other fields as well. Fields. I couldn't find out a better, better picture. <laughs> um, and it's important for your apprentice to know uh, what they do. So if you're working at a company with multiple uh, experts, it's, a, it's good to have him talk to those people and see how they work. Make, make sure that you let him talk at least to a designer and a back-end developer. They are probably the people who's, who are working closest to him. And communication is also an important skill. 
Um, for example, he has to learn how to explain his thoughts and problems to non-technical people. And one way to train this is to let him join company meetings you're attending, if that is possible. Don't expect him to contribute, but uh, he learns how people communicate in those situations. There is a lot to learn in just a couple of months as an apprentice, and for some it's easier than for others. So when you start working with a new apprentice, sit down together and make a checklist of everything you want him to learn, but also what he, <coughs> want, what he wants to learn. And keep it realistic, because he doesn't have to be an expert at the end. So I'm a bit <laughs> fast, but one last thing. If you are here not looking for new people, but looking for an apprenticeship yourself, you shouldn't wait for the right job to find you. Uh, find companies where you, would like to, uh, where you would like to work. And if there aren't any job openings or uh, apprenticeships, don't let that stop you. Uh, if you make the right impression by being creative and eager, the right company would consider taking you on as an apprentice. But if an, a company doesn't normally do apprenticeships, make sure that you know what you want out of it, not only in skills, but also financially. If you don't need a lot, a lot of money during the apprenticeship, it should be one of the earlier things to tell them. But most importantly, just be yourself. If you manage to get your job, job interview, don't try to be someone you think that they want you to be. If you don't want you as you, then you won't be learning a lot from them. And finally, work hard. Not only during working hours, but also at home. Make sure you get things done, uh, to do at home, like reading books, blog posts, or anything else. So, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and that you're considering accepting future developers at your company soon.